Thanks to all of you for coming. My name is Andres Martinez. I'm a vice president here at the New America Foundation and the director of our Schwartz Fellows Program. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to make a few housekeeping notes, which is that this is being webcast, so obviously it's all on the record. And please be mindful of that when it comes to Q&A time. Wait for the microphone, which will be circulating, um, so people can, can hear online and, and identify yourself when you ask a question. Um, I am very excited to have this conversation this evening about Mexico and about how Mexico is visually represented. I grew up in Mexico, so I have a very parochial interest in the subject. And one of my frustrations is it seems that when it comes to our neighboring country, we often have a hard time, it seems to me, focusing on more than one aspect of Mexico at a time. Whether it's, gee, it would be really great to have California, or immigration, or NAFTA, or more recently the drug situation. So it seems that we often end up with a, a, a vision, a portrayal of Mexico that is a little bit too limited. And for a long time I felt that the portrayal of Mexico in the media has been too negative too obsessed with one single topic. You know, we often don't think about it in these terms, but the United States has been historically, I would say, quite privileged as a major continental power to not have to deploy its military to protect its borders. Um, you know, it, if you think about it, we've had this, the advantages of an island power because we've had Canada to the north and Mexico to the south, and we've been able to project our military prowess elsewhere in the world because we haven't had to deploy armies along our border, which is fairly unique for landmass continental powers in history. Yes, we can quibble, obviously, about how many border patrol agents to post along the border, but that's, that's just a very different proposition in terms of magnitude, and I think that's sometimes helpful to remind people of in terms of the context and what we're talking about. And mind you, this is a border where plenty of land has changed hands, and yet there's we've had the benefit of a sensible, peaceful uh, neighbor. It also is, strikes me that when it comes to the economy, uh, Mexico is more of a success story than we often assume or think of in this country, and especially in terms of what comes across in the media portrayal. Mexico is not a poor country by global standards. It's more of a middle class one. It's sort of one of the poor members of the OECD, a nation with enough resources to be the second largest buyer of American goods, um, a nation that's often cited for its macroeconomic stability and fiscal prudence in the last 15, 20 years, which has enabled an expansion of the middle class. And these are stories that often get lost in the perspective. Uh, huge problems, to be sure, particularly in terms of how the wealth is distributed, uh, which is a fairly familiar problem to plenty of developing nations around the world, and even some developed ones, but let's not get into that. Um, you also have you know, a country that outperforms most of the BRIC nations on a, on a wide array of uh, living standard indices, and yet the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, get a lot more uh, hype and positive media in the United States. So I've been a little bit frustrated about the portrayal of Mexico in, in American media, um, although I would say that uh, starting with the inauguration of the new president, Peña Nieto, on December 1st, it felt like a memo went out to uh, you know, mainstream media, you know, here's your uh, talking points, or maybe there was a, it was a memo calling for a bit of a corrective narrative. And on the eve of that, swearing in of President Peña Nieto, the Washington Post, the New York Times, a lot of outlets had more uh, balanced stories about Mexico, at least uh, pieces that took a broader uh, perspective and looked at the economy and other stories, not just the drug war. Um, some of them actually struck me as almost too positive, but I'm not going to complain <laughs> given where we had been. And the economists around that time also had a special section that I feel the Mexican embassy must have uh, you know, ordered a million copies of because it was so optimistic. And then yesterday I picked up the New York Times and, or I should say I, I tapped in the New York Times because I, I didn't have the physical copy. And there was Thomas Friedman um, discovering Mexico in a column that, that uh, was entitled, How Mexico Got Back in the Game. And it's this breathless piece on how Mexico could be the next India or China. Um, and it was, it was you know, spot on and, and in some ways hitting on all the issues that I've, I've frustrated that have been absent from the coverage. Uh, but I did grimace a bit at one line where he writes, 
It's as if that it, it was as if Mexicans decided to no longer be defined by the drug war. And I, I thought that was a bit amusing because I feel like it's been the media in this country that's been defining them by the drug war, not Mexicans themselves for the past years. Um, but Thomas Friedman went to Mexico and decided that they had, Mexicans had decided to think of themselves differently, be, perhaps because he was there. Um, uh, so again, but the, the trick, the challenge in how we think of countries and how they're portrayed, it, it's one of perspective. You know, it, the drug war obviously is a hugely important part of the Mexico story. Uh, you know, you cannot dismiss 70,000 deaths in the last six years. Um, just last week, there was a, a admirable report that came out from Human Rights Watch on a lot of the atrocities. Um, that have been committed in the persecution of this struggle against the cartels. Um, and, and even on the economic front, you know, one of the things that's startling is that you have a 2,000 mile border between two countries uh, that have a, you know, living standards that are about four or five times different. You know, so income in the U.S., you know, depending on how you measure, it's about four or five times higher than Mexico. So, it's, fine, it's all fine and well to say, well, Mexico, by global standards, is a middle-income country. I mean, it has income that might be 15 or 16 times greater than Afghanistan. But again, you have this somewhat, I was always told as a journalist, never uses the term unique. But it's fairly unique to have this shared border between two countries with such disparate living standards, even if one is not you know, dire poor by global standards, that the contrast is what creates a lot of the tension. Not to mention the fact that, given our subject this evening, Mexico does find itself between the suppliers of very expensive illicit drugs and the consumers, and that is not a great place to be. Um, so uh, to beat a dead horse, it all comes back to perspective, to how we compose the picture, what we focus in on. Um, I feel like there has been some remedy to the distortive uh, representation of Mexico in recent months. Uh, I fear that maybe, you know, there's a danger that we might go too far and forget about the, the drug violence. You know, I just wish that we were, there was a way to have a more balanced portrayal over time of the, all of the diversity of issues that go into this relationship between the two countries and what's happening on Mexico. So given these challenges of composition and focus, you know, it couldn't be more appropriate to have with us uh, Louis Palou, who is the first photojournalist to be a Schwartz Fellow here at New America. Uh, Louis, as many of you already know, is an award-winning documentary photographer whose work has appeared in publications and exhibitions internationally, including the New York Times, Foreign Policy, where, where some of this work has appeared, Time, The Atlantic, and the BBC. He has been awarded numerous accolades, including awards from Pictures of the Year International, White House News Photographers Association, National Magazine Award, Alexia Foundation Documentary Photograph Photography Grant, uh, Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting Grant, uh, which we really want to make a, a special effort to thank the Pulitzer Center for making a lot of this work possible. Uh, that's been very uh, appreciated both by Louis but also by New America. And as I said, Louis is in his second year of the Bernard Schwartz Fellowship Program here in New America. Uh, from the first day that I, I met Louis when, his at, when he applied for the fellowship, and I remember as we were going through the applications, the question arose, um, do we consider photographers? Because usually our fellows are involved in, in, uh, in writing books. And, and I, I looked at his work and I said, well, we, we do now. I mean, Louis just, he goes deep. And Steve Call, our president, uh, who had spent a lot of time obviously reporting in Afghanistan for many years, was, was just blown away by the depth and the insights of Louis's work in and out of Kandahar for about five years, which was a project he was doing prior to taking this on. He has also gone deep on issues, on social and political issues involving mining in Canada and the situ situation uh, at the prisons in Guantanamo Bay. So I think that's about all the nice things I'm going to say about you tonight, Louis. Um, thank you so much for all of you for coming. And uh, Louis, the stage is yours. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Doug Coleman. I'm the special agent in charge of DEA in Arizona. And uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to talk a little today about an uh, uh, investigation that involved the seizure of a uh, cross-border tunnel. Joining we me went inside, is, uh, and uh, there cut in the floor was this 
shaft with a ladder that went down about 50 feet. And there was a 240-yard tunnel that went all the way under the border and came up in a, a business in Mexico. These aren't five guys in the corner selling dime bags of pot. The topic of discussion on the U.S.-Mexico border before the drug war was illegal crossing of Mexicans to work in the United States. The difference now is that those, those routes that they would sneak across the border on are all controlled by drug cartels. Arizona has the least amount of security on the border. It also has the hardest part to cross. There's a big, massive desert. Um, you also have Tucson and Phoenix right above the border. Once people get into those cities, it's hard to find them. The main injury that Mexican migrants uh, get while crossing the border because they walk huge distances in, in, in incredibly high heat is massive blisters on the soles of their feet. I photographed one woman uh, who had just been deported back into a shelter in Nogales, Mexico. And uh, she'd walk in the desert for six days. I mean, you can get disoriented, you can get lost in the desert, and there are border patrol everywhere. Sometimes people get overwhelmed by heat, and they just say, hey, leave me here, and they just wait till hopefully border patrol arrests them. Uh, anyway... I'm just going to get going. Uh, I, what I want to start about is, I, I don't want this to be a night like, hey, here's my favorite pictures, and this is what I did. And I want you to understand uh, the history of where guys like me come from. Like, I don't just show up and think, wow, there's lots of murders down there. Wow, I've got to go cover the news, and I come back. Thanks. So there's going to be a lot of graphic pictures. It's just part of the subject. So uh, just beware. As we go, there's going to be more graphic photographs. So I want to you, give you a little bit of a narrative, of my personal narrative, why I'm interested in Mexico, and what I looked at, and what many other photographers before me and contemporary colleagues, many of, some of them are in the crowd here, ha have been influenced by. This is a picture by, Fran uh, an etching by Francisco Goya. It's called, from a series called The Disasters of War. And sorry, with years, because years are important for history. I'm going to go to my notes. This is from like 1810, 1820. He made drawings of the atrocities committed by French troops while they were in Spain. <coughs> Now, the difference between this and other artists doing things is he actually made etchings and plates and made multiple prints. So, he like distribution. It's like, kind of like the early fundamental idea of sharing pictures with people of, of atrocities. This is from the First World War. Um, any sort of Commonwealth countries realize the First World War is a big part of our history. So, these are dead Canadian soldiers. It's called the Sunken Road. And that the Canadian government actually commissioned war artists to go out and paint scenes of the war to bring back home as to share visuals. A, a, a sort of a, an equal to this in America would have been some of the photographers like Alexander Gardner from the First World War. Uh, sorry, the Civil War. I mean, U.S. Civil War. Um, this is a picture by Lewis Hine. Uh, many photographers think of him as a photographer in the history of photography. But he's actually more of a social activist. He used photography to photograph child labor in the United States. And he's probably one of the few people actually who used photography to actually make a massive change in government policy here in this country. So I just wanted to show those pictures, just sort of things that I looked at and influenced me and sort of got me interested in being a, a photographer, in especially focusing on social and political issues. I'm just going to do a quick brief sort of view through some of the, the early parts of my work, just so you understand how everything's connected. Um, I grew up in Canada. Canada is one of the biggest mining centers in the world. All world mine finance mostly goes through the Toronto Stock Exchange. Spent about 12 years as in a copper mine, photographing in mines. And for me, my parents were immigrant workers, so the whole idea of photographing workers was fascinating to me. It's sort of a, a, an element we all don't get to talk about enough of, I think. And a lot of this work was influenced by some of the early paintings, and we'll see one by Diego Rivera, and Images of Labor. I'm going to fast forward uh, through sort of the narrative of my body's work to show you how everything's connected. Uh, and then... Around 2006, I had been working as a staff photographer at the Globe and Mail. And I, I, Canada had not gone to war since the Korean War, so it was a big, big deal that Canada was going to war. And they were in Kandahar. And I went. And uh, right away, as, I would, as a photographer, much of what we report on is right pretty much in front of us, or we can't photograph it. I would get articles while I was kind of on the front lines covering the war. And the article sort of didn't match what I was seeing a lot of times. And, and that's... That's sometimes a casualty of, of the economics and the logistics of covering war. But I just felt like as the years went on and as, as I was seeing the war, I was wondering why the editor would pick this photograph or that photograph. And a lot of photographers go through that every day. But there's just not enough room. There's not enough space. It's, it's what news is. I just felt like over the years, 
I could tell a lot of different stories with different pictures of the article. I could change your view of a story. So like, you know, an Afghan soldier searching a civilian. An image of fear, an Afghan soldier terrified in the middle of a battle. A dead insurgent. Why don't we, we hardly ever see insurgents in photographs. And I just started asking, who are the gatekeepers and how, how are our views of the world, how are policymakers shaped by what pictures they're shown in our news? Or do I show a picture of humanity? This is an injured Afghan soldier singing to some birds. Or maybe it's something a little more abstract. Uh, Kandahar is surrounded by grape fields. It's the breadbasket of Afghanistan. And the whole idea of like, this is pretty much based on a Caravaggio painting. That's what I saw in my mind. There's a picture called Sick Bacchus, where he's chewing on these grapes. It just happened, I thought, wow, it's a Caravaggio painting. And the whole idea of being a little more deeper layer symbolic, like you know, sweet and sour, bullets and grapes. Fruits, fruits of war, fruits of nature kind of thing. <clears throat> or is it about civilian casualties? And I don't think we see enough pictures of civilian casualties because any war, anyone who's covered war or knows war, knows that this is one of the number one things that happens when, when people go to war. This is a 19-year-old man who got caught between uh, the Taliban throwing it, uh, putting an ambush on some Afghan soldiers and he was killed in the crossfire. Or do we have sympathetic pictures of soldiers? Is this, how, how, which of these pictures on a story in Afghanistan after over 10 years of being at this war, which of those pictures, if you're an editor, are you going to pick? And this kind of slowly develops into what happened when I started covering Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> now let's talk about use of aesthetics and the politics and social issues of aesthetics. If I show a picture of blood in black and white, it's black. That's not real. Or is it? Or am I unethically using color as an aesthetic to get your attention? Is, is it ethical to use color in, in, this use, in this way? This is a medevac helicopter over Kandahar. I mean, I'm using, I'm using color here as an aesthetic. When Susan Mizellas covered the Civil War in Nicaragua, she was criticized heavily from the use of very bright colors. She was one of the early sort of combat photographers to start showing war in color. This is an Afghan soldier with henna stained hands, warming his hands in Kandahar. Or do I actually have to show you the horror to tell you about horror? I mean, my whole, I went to art school, so the structurality compositionally of all my pictures are based on paintings. It's like a Jackson Pollock painting. That's what I was thinking when I was taking the photograph. And that what's on the table would never get published. So I as, the, I mean, I photographed the whole scene, but as the editor, uh, this is the photo I filed amongst a few others. Or a photo like this. I mean, this is a wounded Afghan soldier, and it's, it's real, but is it real? Uh, it's blue light. Do we see in blue light? The helicopter has just been bombed and an emergency light turns on in the back of the helicopter while we're flying to bring this casualty back to Kandahar Airfield. So let's just understand how we, how, how, we, how are photo images disseminated? How do we share our pictures? Because this really ties into how we perceive or misperceive what's going on in Mexico or any conflict for that matter. So everybody who knows me knows that I, I share my pictures cross platform. Like this is a photo book. This is for my minor's body of work. So your standard two page book. You know, th this is a very old way of looking at pictures. This is an installation of my marine portraits. They're about 10 feet high. They're transparent, hung in a cathedral in Amsterdam. Same pictures in color as a magazine cover. This picture on the right is the landmine victim. In color, and if it were in focus, they would never publish this photo. Actually, it's rare for even to publish the black and white photo. So I'm using aesthetics, and I'm using a technical technique to make the picture publishable. And I, this is a traditional exhibition. It was at this exhibition that I had this kind of idea. I thought, I had this exhibition, people came, they liked it. And a few of my friends were like, hey, I would love, mostly photo editors, some of them are in this room, are like, wow, I'd love to see more of these photographs. Like, what else do you have? And I said, I thought, wow, you know, I think on the second floor, I asked the curator, I said, I made a bunch of laser copies and I hung all the photos I didn't put in the edit in. I thought, because this is what we never see, right? We never question these mastheads of these respected magazines. What are you publishing? What are you not publishing? What are the politics of that particular left wing, right wing? What do they lean, this news organization? So I hung them up, and it kind of got me thinking about who are all these gatekeepers? Why, why is it that one museum has a curator that says this artist is the person with the opinion, and these 20 don't? Or, or this magazine's more respected than that magazine? And how do you know who actually went and reported on what? So we get to Mexico. Uh, 
this is a Diego Rivera paint, uh, painting. It's a mural, actually, and just be bear with me as, uh, as I go through some of the dates here, just so we understand sort of where all the different histories from where I'm coming from. This is uh, the enslavement and the Indian. It's in the Cortez Palace. And I want people to understand that in terms of war and tragedy, Mexico has had its share of it, for sure. A uh, million people, up to a million killed in, in the, the revolution. Uh, the enslavement and the colonization by the Spanish. And this is a painting that I looked at very early on before I did my miners project. It's called The Agitator. These are from 1929, 1930. And it's about the community talking about the condition of workers. And as an Italian immigrant kid, that, that's what we, that we, all our parents were like, my mom was a seamstress in a factory. My dad was a stonemason. My whole street was people like that. So I really related to this. The other fascinating thing is that we think about is that if you want to see a, an, an exhibition of Diego Rivera paintings, you'll never see it in the city you're in because these murals are on giant walls and buildings. The whole idea of the internet, like the big television, Mexico's too poor for that. They made big giant murals so that people can go look at them. That was like the big television set. It was the theater of their history. And that's what Diego Rivera and they were like the big three, Oro Orozco and Siqueiros, were, were mostly uh, commissioned by the government to do. And of course, images of death. Mexico's very famous for it. Uh, this, this artist, Jose Guadalupe Posada, this is from 1903, is probably made, is one of the famous and made that whole image of death a daily part of Mexican life. Uh, not to be afraid of showing uh, uh, up until today. This is a, a romantic photo book by Henry Cartier-Bresson. These are all the different ways we can see Mexico, right? This is one of my favorite photographers, I think one of the greatest living artists in Mexico. This is Graciela Iturbide, she's still alive. This is from 1991. And this is where we turn to what's personal to me. Because as a kid, I grew up in an Italian neighborhood. And something you never talked about was organized crime. We always knew who was who. It's always like that. 1991, Mexican border. And this is the other vision we have of Mexico. Well, this is valid. Mexico has lots of great vacation places. This is an area use of photographs to communicate all these different things about Mexico. This is a police press, con uh, press conference held by the Mexican government with the federal police who've just arre arrested some, some narcos. It's a set up news event meant to control image or a message. <coughs> this is called a narcomanta. This is a commercially produced banner, they happen all the time, that the, the narcos, the cartels hang up. And it's a message to the public about what one, in this case, one cartel's doing to another. I cropped it out because we don't need to see it, but there's all heads and arms at the bottom. And they're commercially published and produced. So everybody's into message control here. And I just thought, as I did the Mexico project, I thought I have some responsibilities of what I'm gonna cover and not cover and what I'm gonna photograph and how I'm gonna photograph it. This is some of my work in Mexico. Uh, I chose not to shoot in color. I just felt like all the dead body pictures were going to overpower everything else. So I, 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 edited them, I, I edited them all in black and white and made them black and white. This is a man who is, and, and you have to understand, a lot of these exec executions, people's hands are bound. So at one point they were somewhere where they were held or kidnapped or tortured. And they're usually shot on the spot. They're held somewhere and then they're dropped somewhere and dumped. And it's usually symbolic where they're dumped. This is in Cuyacan, Sinaloa. It's the cradle. I wonder if the batteries are dead. There we go. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, let's understand the deeper sort of uh, social structure of, uh, of what's going on. If you want to cross illegally into the United States now, the facilitators who help my Mexican migrants cross must pay someone. They always have had to. But now all that money goes to organized crime groups. The, the Mexican cartels are far more sophisticated. These aren't guys on the corner selling dime bags of pot. These are multi-billion dollar complex organizations with connections throughout the world. Uh, she's from Chiapas. She spent about six days in the desert of Arizona until she was arrested by US Border Patrol. And it's, it's simple, some of the policy ideas to understand here is she's coming up here to find work. She's coming up here to improve her life. Chiapas is one of the poorest states in Mexico. You understand who the assassins are? Anyone who's bringing out guns or security situations, those are double taps. That, that's a professional hitman. That's someone most likely trained by another professional or someone who's in the military who's probably special forces. That's, this is a scene of an assassination of three men in broad daylight in the main street in Cuyacán, Sinaloa. 
If you wonder why all the Mexican security forces wear masks, they're just trying to hide their identity so the cartels don't find out who they are and go and kill them. These are three men executed and dumped between territory between the Juarez cartel and the Sinaloa cartel. Now, I only have three pictures I'm going to show tonight, and, or in any of my edits, three pictures of dead bodies. And I want to communicate sort of three different ideas with them. Territory, I don't just publish, that was another rule I made. No publishing dead bodies because I happened to be there and I got a dead body and it was a murder. I wanted to explain some factual levels to what was going on. Again, bound hands, shot in the head, executed on the spot, on the territory line. So one cartel, I, I was explaining in this, one cartel fighting for another over territory. I think that this, showing this picture of this man here is probably, if anyone's involved in policy, it's understanding people like this that you're going to figure out your policy. Luis, when he was two, was taken across the border by his mother to work in Arizona. They snuck over from Juarez into El Paso, ended up in Arizona. He is the cannon fodder of this drug war. Drug war. He is the man with no education, grew up poor, fell into gangs and drugs, and no opportunity. And every time he got sent to jail, instead of treatment and rehab, it was like training to become a better criminal. And then every time he came out, he was connected to a higher and higher and more powerful criminal organization. These are young girls, uh, just a lot of stories on this. The young girls part of a group who dress up as angels and protest against in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, protest against the police and the government. And they go to mostly to the scenes of murders to do this. This is at the scene of where a 14 year old is killed in Juarez. If I'm going to show dead bodies, if I'm going to show the narcos killing someone, I'm going to show people are being killed by the government because there's every side, uh, sorry, in every war there's two sides. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, if your government's going to be doing state-sponsored killings for, even for reasons to protect the public, it's important that we see that as well. This is a, a man believed to be part of Sinaloa cartel. They were hunting for El Fantasma, who I think they just caught actually. This is in Quila, just outside Cuyacan. And, uh, I know he was someone not on, the, on the, the government side, heavily armed, like probably 10 weapons in his truck. Uh, the truck was on fire out in the field when we arrived. This is a street level shooting. He's not dead and his face isn't blown off, which means he was shot probably with a handgun really close up. Apparently it was over, arguing over the street price of drugs. Like, this is, this is what a lot of people gotta understand now. Nothing I say is absolute because in different cartels and different groups in different areas, numbers fluctuate. But my understanding is, for me, at least my interpretation, a cartel isn't 10,000 guys that are part of the Zetas. The cartel are, for me, the main, like the board of directors, the main leaders. And cartel is about, that word for me is about controlling the price and flow and the logistics and the overall organization. For my interpretation, from what I, fe I feel, is everybody else is kind of like affiliated gangs and organizations and sort of co contractors and subcontractors. And so the whole idea is this probably guy was shot was probably selling drugs less than someone else somewhere else. Because it's, it's, these organized crime groups are like the police of the underworld. If you get out of line, usually you get killed. If you do something wrong, someone comes to warn you or tells you, no, no, you're not supposed to be doing it like that. Or, hey, this is our territory. If you want to come through here, you pay us to move your drugs through our area. And one of the biggest parts of the drug war, what people don't understand in Mexico, is a lot of the killing is fighting over the territory of who has the right to control what drug route. This is a man who's a heroin addict. This is in, in Juarez. And uh, these are track marks. And uh, all his veins have collapsed in his arms and his legs. Uh, there, there aren't enough drug rehab clinics on the border anymore. I've gone to a lot of them. A lot of people I've interviewed at the government-run drug rehab clinics have said that it's quadrupled, the number of drug addicts on the border, actually, because the amount of drugs in the... So you put security along the border, and this is the whole idea of development, social infrastructure, and, and security. If you're going to do a bunch of security, it's like Afghanistan. It's the same thing. You do a bunch of security. If you don't have social infrastructure to follow, then you're going to have problems like this. So uh, this man's been deported. He got hooked on drugs in the United States. He was, he was living illegally, and now Mexico's got to deal with it as well. So the security's against the border, so all the drugs get smuggled up, and they sit longer on the border before they can get smuggled. There's a lot more drugs ending up in border towns, and, and there's leakage out more into the communities than there used to be. This is uh, in Laredo, just north of Laredo, Texas. This, is, this looks like a lot of drugs. This is nothing. This is like only 116 pounds of pot. 
Um, so every now every border checkpoint, like you know where you show your passport and they have the booths, along the border on every major interstate, there's a second checkpoint where they check you where they've got dogs sniffing dogs. And there are multiple checkpoints, movable small checkpoints they put in different areas all along the border. It's almost like there's two borders now. If you want to understand the politics and the power structure of Mexico, from this president all the way down to some of the local narcos, you go to the mayors. This is in the mayor's office in the Juarez Valley. And if you want to understand Juarez, you got to go into the valley. The valley is probably one of the most uh, strategic and important drug trafficking routes outside of the actual city itself of Juarez. Uh, there's a, I don't know the exact measurement, it's like 50, 60 miles of interstate that parallels very closely to the actual border, which makes it ideal for smuggling to get drugs right onto the interstate. The whole idea of drug smuggling is you want to get on a big highway and get up into a big city. Everywhere else, the interstate is very far away from the border. It makes it a lot more difficult to smuggle drugs. Now, it's, these are the history of some of the mayors in this area, mostly one party rule for 70 years in some towns. These are the guys that have to deal with the local narcos. These are the guys who are getting killed by some of the local narcos. When I got in there, there was a picture missing. I thought just symbolically it made a lot of sense. So uh, anyway, this is the end of the border on the Pacific West Coast state. And uh, that's it for my slideshow. And thank you. Oh. So yeah. we're gonna we're just gonna chat for a couple of minutes and then open it up uh, to you all for questions and comments and nice. then I was gonna I forgot to mention this. Oh. Oh, yes. tell us about Sorry, that. I forgot about this. Uh, so, uh, remember the, the exhibition that I mentioned? And I kind of started thinking, hey, you know, like, why don't I publish my own newspaper to, like, make it so I control what's going on? So you, you can all have a copy of this. There's going to be a box. Take it yourself at, on the other end. But here's the trick to understand. The instructions are on the back. And this was, this was sponsored by New America. And Andres got behind this, and I, I really want to thank him for helping with this. So there's 16 pictures. You can only see eight at a time. On one side, it's all dead bodies and drugs. On the other side, it's just daily life in Mexico. The only way you can see the pictures is you've got to take the newspaper apart, the whole idea of dismantling the platform of news. So when you lay them out, you either have eight pictures of one story, no drugs, no violence, or eight pictures of all drugs and violence, completely two unbalanced views of Mexico, or mixed up. So you're the editor, curator, censor, whatever you want. You can even take it apart and hang it up as an exhibition if you want. So it's, there you go. So th th there'll be, there'll be at, we'll take questions and then there's a box here. We'll rip it open. Sorry, I forgot about that. Sorry about that. Thanks, Louis, and congratulations again. Thanks. And I, I, I don't think, uh, I think we should have more think tank events where we get to see Diego Rivera murals too. Totally. Uh, <clears throat> before we open it up, I just had a, I wanted to, get your thoughts on, you know, you showed the, uh, the sort of the poster, Manta as they call them in Mexico. Yep. Uh, I think it was Chapo's cartel yep. sending a message to the people about how he's, his cartel is getting rid of those mugrosos uh, Zetas, yep. those dirty Zetas. And you said part of the communique, communique, public communique was also parts, you know, body parts. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like the visualization of violence, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the extent to which um, the communication itself uh, is fueling some of the violence. It, you know, there, it, th there does seem to be just an element of spectacle involved where, I mean, you, you, you in Mexi across Mexico, you read these, uh, you know, uh, papers that are obsessed with showing all the dead bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's a way for the cartels to sort of you know, it seems like they're in a competitive contest to sort of create more s spectacular gore than their competitors, and it's a form of intimidation. It's a form of sending these messages. And what's your thought? I mean, as somebody who's in the business of 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 thinking about where the boundaries are and and the impact of these images. I mean, to what extent is the image itself and the desire to visualize violence kind of begetting more violence in the context of two cartels going at it in a particular mm -hmm. region? So uh, 
I, I think I, well, I cover 110 murders a month. Like, it's just insane. Like, I have so many dead body pictures. There's no in, shortage. In Sinaloa. Right? Sinaloa and, and Ciudad Juarez. So those are the two where I, I thought, okay, I'm going to cover just violence on these two. And then I started going to other places, and I, I just did not cover the violence. I wanted to cover other elements and build deeper layers, especially on the social issue side. You can show up pretty much right away, and you can see it was just an assassination or a hit, or sometimes it was like sending a message. The whole idea is that if there's a bunch of pictures of dead bodies all the time, you'd mostly know they're done by the cartel guys. So everybody in town's like, hey, if you mess around, you'll be in that photo next. So it's definitely message spread spreading. And I mean, the guys who sell the newspapers down, they need more dead bodies, the more newspapers they sell. That, that's a known and agreed upon thing. Uh, so it's like the mafia, you know. I, I grew up seeing pictures of mafia hits all the time. I mean. It's funny, I would talk to Mexicans and different people in the Mexican government, they were talking about how hard they're being hit. I'm like, hey, I'm Italian, man. They made Academy Award winning films about how we killed people. I mean, and see, it's we, like, it was like every time, oh yeah, the Sopranos, you know? And the kind of thing is, is that what, what really disturbed me, I, I guess, as I started working on this project, is I thought, wow, well, we've made like heroes, like, hey, you know, Breaking Bad, like, yeah, no, no, don't catch him. He's the drug dealer, don't catch him. And I thought, when did we start cheering for these, these criminals? These, these people are murderers, I mean. And I just felt like I saw a film called Gamora, as in Sodom and Gomorrah. If you wanna see a, a true film on the Italian mafia, it's maybe three or four years old, that is a film where you don't like anybody by the end. And it's uh, about the Neapolitan <coughs> mafia, the Camorra in Naples, and uh, it's in Italian, and all the actors are real people, actually. Yeah, it's, it's called Gamora with a G, so. Um, but anyway, back to what you were asking is, um, I just felt like I, I could go to scenes and I thought, this explains something. This tells me something about what this cartel is almost killing off this one. This one gives an important fact of history, of news, of perspective of who's fighting who. And I just felt like a lot of times the heads and all that sort of stuff, and there's plenty of that, is really just, it, it's kind of like one tribe trying to scare off the other tribe. And it's also, you know, the Mexican government has all these, they use photography as well. Like, we're arresting people, we're arresting people, we've busted more drugs, we're burning more drugs. And I just, I would not go to any of those press conferences because I just felt like it was a set up photo and it was not something I needed to communicate to people with, with the kind of project I was doing. Because it, it's actually something that's meant to get press to lean to what their message is, which is, no, 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 the narcos are not in control, we're in control. The narcos are like, no, 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 they're not in control. Here's some 10 people hung from the bridge. We're in control. Well, what's also shocking to American sensibilities when you go down there is, is not just the photo ops and the press conferences that the government puts on to show that they're making progress or checking you know, more cartel heads, kingpins mm -hmm. off their list of people they've arrested or killed, yep. but, but the fact that they, uh, in a lot of these cases, go out of their way to humiliate the bodies. And they, you know, I, we saw one, I think, where yep. the, 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 peso bill, the 50 peso bills yep. and are pasted onto them. Yep. And that's, you know, is there any... What's the effect of that on the well, other yeah, side? Yeah, the, the peso bills. That, like, th th I think that started, uh, it started with, there was a guy named Beltran. The, 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 the military killed him and they put all the money on his body. It was like a horrifically infamous photo. And it just started being like, hey, we can be more, we can be, we can scare people more if we show more horrific stuff. And it's just gone <coughs> to some crazy point. Like, it, every day in, in, in Silo, like, there'd be A1 photos, full bleed with dead bodies, like, the daily newspaper down in some of these towns. And I just thought it's gone completely out of control. And uh, uh, that was one of the goals and the fundamental base of my project was to not, not be sucked into that. Just so that there was a little more to understanding poverty, social issues, social infrastructure, and those really important things. So that, that's something I wanted to focus on. I have about four more questions in mind, but I, I don't, I'm looking at the clock. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I want to open it up to your questions and, and uh, comments for, 15 minutes or so, and then we can uh, have more refreshment, yeah, please. And again, wait for the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Stein. Um, I'm curious, you say you focused on um, two places, one of which was Ciudad Juarez, and yet um, my understanding of many of the killings in Juarez is that they were of young women, often working in the um, Maquille, whatever they're called, the factories. What is the connection there with the drug war, in your opinion? 
Oh, okay, uh, first, first just want to clarify. I worked across the entire border back and forth on both sides and, and many other places in Mexico. Uh, those two places, I, when I say Cuyacan and Ciudad Juarez, those were those are places I just said I'm going to cover murders in two places, and then I'm going to, everywhere else I'm going to cover other stuff. Um, what you're talking about uh, the, the murdering of women? Uh, say you take one years of homicides in Ciudad Juarez is probably like 3,000 at, at, at its peak. Uh, the, the killing of women, mostly in the drug war, is not completely directly related. Uh, I, I think that it started earlier on before the actual drug war was launched, and. It was happening in Juarez, but mostly in the valley in Juarez. And to this day, they still have not, they, the Mexican government, the authorities, haven't figured out everything to do with it or who, the, who, the, who was doing it. But uh, there was a lot of mutilating going on. But the numbers of men killed, the proportion is, you know, in the drug war. It's, it's a massive amount compared to the women. And it's not as related. It's not something I focus on because it really is just, it's a separate issue from the drug war. Um, yes, sir. I'll just wait for the microphone and... Um, Samar Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Um, uh, I have a, a concern that this entire drug war in Mexico is funded, fueled by the United States. I mean, if the U.S. didn't pay and buy their president, almost, and put them into this kind of a approach to it, where all these people will be fighting, uh, uh, this would not happen. So would you like to comment on what kind of, because you mentioned that Mexicans had, uh, Mexicans or Spanish had killed millions of people before. I mean, that has happened in this country too, when uh, this country uh, went through all that. And in fact, this country used to pay people to get Indians' head, you know. I mean, how many heads can you bring? You can become a million. Maybe you killed a million, you become a million. In those days, a million was a lot of money and nobody got it. Uh, I think we need to understand that Mexico is not just selling drugs to the United States. Let, let's just understand that Mexico, Mexican organized crime groups have connections to crime groups throughout the world. Ndrangheta, <coughs> no one probably never heard that word before. Probably the most powerful Italian-based mafia group, well beyond what the Sicilians ever were. Actually, the diminishing of the Sicilians made the Calabrian mafia even bigger. They control, I mean, these are all guesses. No one can actually, it's not like these crime groups say, hey, we shipped this much coke this year. So there, there's kind of educated guesses. But they control massive, massive amounts of, of distribution of drugs through Europe. And I think that, uh, I think the United States would love to control Mexico, but I don't think Mexico will let the United States control them. So I think that there's some influence there, but. Uh, everything. Well, I do think that uh, there's a, there's a the, the perception in Mexico, uh, yeah, of course, it's hard, you can't, generalize too much, but generally there's been, I think, a, uh, a sense that we, a lot of our people, our people, you know, if you talk to people in Mexico, they, they would say that a lot of their, you know, military, cops, uh, you know, mayors in small towns, and, and a lot, plenty of innocent people who get caught up in this, are dying as a result of uh, activity that's be, still being driven largely by the U.S. That, and, and and I think a lot of people are seizing on the notion that if only the U.S. Uh, legalized drugs, and I think this, this, could, this always runs the risk of becoming sort of an oversimplified uh, narrative, that, that sort of it would be a panacea if, you know, uh, and the, but what's been striking to me looking, you know, tracking public opinion in Mexico over time is the extent to which, you know, very conservative elements of Mexican society have now kind of, be, just out of the sheer frustration and exasperation with the situation, um, are also pushing this this notion that the U.S. really needs to decide, you know, what it's <laughs> what it's going to do. Either you know, st stop having this tremendous demand for illegal drugs, or legalize it and regulate it in some way. That because there's a sense that the U.S. has sort of outsourced a lot of the law enforcement related killings um, to Mexico, and so I, I I don't know if that's exactly where you were getting at. But I would also I wouldn't divorce. I mean, I think there's still a fair amount of agency on the part of the Mexican government to take in, uh, to take this on. I mean, there was a, you know, a new president in 2006 who had a very black and white view of things. And while some of his uh, other political leaders in Mexico for quite some time had had a sense of, you know, so long as the violence isn't out of control, we know that these groups are out there and if they want to traffic stuff to the U.S., we're not going to get in, in between that. 
President Calderon had more of a sort of sense that uh, this is a long-term threat to the integrity of the Mexican state. We have to take these guys on. The extent to which he was willing to take them on and the suddenness with which he was willing to take them on took a lot of people in the American government by surprise. So I think there was a f plenty of independent agency on the part of the Mexican government there. Um, there was a question here in the third row. Hello, Ashley Garcia, student at Georgetown University. Um, I had a question about your project overall, and I was wondering if you faced any challenges with the untold stories of the drug war, like trying to cover women as victims and victimizers, displaced um, individuals, or those that had been extraditioned, um, images of money laundering, or you know, cases where you see businesses that have been um, in the money laundering business, yeah. et cetera. Uh, I covered a lot of different stuff. Tonight I kind of focused the theme on how images kind of control how we view the drug war or any sort of war or political issue. Uh, money laundering, I've done a lot of research with lots of some of the top <coughs> world's top sort of experts in organized crime. If you're photographing the money laundering, you're not going to be alive probably the next day if they find you there. I'm not making fun of you, it's just there's things you can't photograph. Uh, I know a lot about money laundering, like smurfing, stuff like that. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of in-depth research. Uh, I'll be honest, there's stuff I know, but like a lot of people talk about organized crime. And I've said this to my colleagues, Montreal is a major hub for smuggling drugs in New York City. New York is the crown jewel of where you want to sell your drugs. That's the market. Uh, I have done the displaced. Uh, some of these places are inaccessible, especially seeing the lower, there's parts in the mountains. We just start getting followed by people. It's kind of like, okay, now let's leave. So please stop following us. We have to change hotels, you know, this kind of thing. So yeah, I've done a lot of these issues. Uh, there's more. If you go on to that, that first multimedia piece I showed, there's a five-part piece there as well. And there's uh, Anima Politico as a five-part piece. If you go to the Pulitzer Center, look up Louis Palou and the Pulitzer Center, and they, they list everything that's been published. It's, it's, it's quite extensive, actually. Um, right there. Right by you, Mike. Hi. On. I'm Richard Solash with Radio Free Europe. Um, uh, a question about... Um, perhaps the different roles of your work. Um, you're obviously a photojournalist, but also an artist. Um, and uh, I think that's evinced not only through the photos, but through the illusions that you've presented to, to past works of art. Um, I wonder, and I know that artists have grappled with this you know, since the beginning, <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to know how you grapple with um, the issue of finding something aesthetic in images of death or suffering. Um, it's obviously something you encountered with a lot of frequency, especially throughout this trip. I was wondering how you personally deal with that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I probably had to start dealing with this when I was in Kandahar, like 2006. Uh, I mean, I've covered my share of murders, covering news, city, city stuff. Uh, and, and it's not easy. Everybody wants to learn something. Everybody here, I, I'd say in this room, is interested in what's happening in the world around them. And there have to be people that go out there, because we all can't go to Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever, or Chicago or even Anacostia here. I mean, there's violence in our own city. There's drug dealers two blocks from my house. I mean, and I know who they are, and they say hi to me. I know who they are. And I think that uh, there need to be people who build those bridges, who go out and are sort of our ambassadors, our envoys. I, I make pictures. Some people make films. Some people write. And I think that uh, there are some really difficult topics. And, and I kind of showed this slideshow. I gave a little history at the beginning is it, it's almost our, our, our duty to, to understand our history and what's happened before us. It's kind of like going to war, you know? You want to look back at, at war's past, like when the Russians were in Afghanistan and we went to Afghanistan, and did we learn anything when we saw that happen to them, that kind of thing. And I think that um, dealing with dead bodies, it's very difficult. One of the first things I covered in Afghanistan was a suicide bomb. You're like heads and body parts all over the place. It's like never forget that scene. It's very. The first thing I'm thinking of is, okay, everything's safe. This is how I work. Everything's safe. Then if it is, I start doing my job. And it basically becomes shoot everything, and then what, what will I be able to publish? If I have time, what can I get? There's a head. My editor's not going to publish a head in the newspaper. But is it really a critical moment in history where showing a photograph of, say, Eddie Adams with the execution of the Viet Cong, where po photos like that at a certain time are important to publish to communicate something? The burning of the American contractors in Fallujah when hanging from the bridge. The execution by the Northern Alliance of the Taliban right after 9-11. These are really important pictures at that time to publish, and they're hard decisions to make. I try and use respect. 
I, you know, there's victims, there, there's family members around screaming over the dead bodies. How close do you get? You gotta be respectful. Sometimes I don't take photographs. Sometimes I just walk away. Uh, sometimes it's just not safe. I gotta, I gotta not stop and not go. So uh, um, every, I take every situation uh, based on what's going on, the ground conditions on every situation I approach. But then again, I still need to get all of you to pay attention to what's going on somewhere. So I, got a, I have like a little toolbox and their composition, uh, lighting, all these sorts of things, how I use my lens focus to try and make a picture <coughs> that's digestible, that's not so shocking that I, I get over that line where it's more about learning and teaching and sharing so that when you look at that picture, you are engaged in that topic, that you don't forget about these people being killed here or this injustice going over there. So if I got to use, and every picture and every scene, you, you, it's a case by case basis. But it is important for us to, to connect with these things. Whether it's a great poetic style of writing or some great sort of bit of filmmaking or the way I use pictures in blood and, and as long as it's done respectfully in every photo, I, I can't have one rule for every single scene I do, but that's sort of how I, I, I work on that. Sure, you gotta. Jason Reed, Reuters. Um, I was wondering how you got along as a photographer. Did you embed yourself with people to get mm -hmm. access? Um, did you have to obviously switch signs to get that? Otherwise, you're going to be an outsider. And if, while I got the mic, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, do you think the people in Mexico are like desensitized to these head pictures on the <coughs> newspaper front pages every day? I mean, I know it, clearly the historic photographs go back into the 1800s, so it's a culture of death and destruction, but at some point, just seeing dead bodies every day, they're, they're not going to be afraid anymore of that sort of, uh, that sort of image. And th th this is a very good question. Um, I, I, I think there was a point, it was in, uh, it was December 2011, I, I'd probably cover about 50, 60 murders every day. There was like 10, 2, 1, 8, 26. And we were trying, uh, I work with someone local. So uh, I, I find them, call them, usually call them a fixer. It's usually a local journalist, someone who speaks the language, knows the area. And they gotta be good drivers, especially if I'm covering spot news like murders, I gotta get there fast before, this is just a legitimate, before they take everything away. And we were driving really fast and uh, there's a woman in front of us blocking the road and she was yelling at the cops, the murder scene, like, hey, look, I'm late. I'm late for cooking dinner for my family. Like, can you hurry up and clear the road off? And it's just like, cause it's, it's every day there. 3,000 murders a year, I mean, I think Wada has had between eight or 10,000 over a few year murders, and it's a city of one million. So, I mean, after a while, it's kind of like, hey, look, I'm, I'm living my life. I have nothing to do with the drug war. I want to get home. You guys work it out and just let me go about my life. And I think it just becomes sort of natural and a part of it. So uh, I think they, there is a desensit desensitization going on, but the fear of what those things represent is very much 100% all the time. People are being killed all the time. Um, in some cities, it, and it goes up and down. It is, it is going lower now, actually, the killing. But everybody has the, it, the rules in place. Hey, look, you get out of line, this is what happens to you. Now, uh, working as a photographer, uh, it's, this is what I learned about, say, compare Afghanistan and Mexico, working there. In Afghanistan, the trouble comes looking for you no matter where you are. Like, it could come from anywhere all the time. Mexico, you only get the kind of trouble you go looking for. Really, overall, that's the case, unless you're in the wrong place the wrong time, which is rare. I always went to look for stuff because it's the drug war, so I had to be very careful. So I grew a beard, I changed my appearance, I would rent one hotel on one side of the city, stay in a hotel on the other side of the city, and I would go into that hotel, my driver picked me up in the back, and then, maybe I should be telling all this on the recording, but, and then drive to another hotel across the city and sleep somewhere else where I'd pay cash and not register. Or I would stay at my fixture's house, I would stay at someone's house. And I would always plan about five interviews, I, I'm, I'm not a really writer, with like the farming association or, so that when, when cartel guys would send people to follow me and say, who is this guy? They would say like, oh, he's just a stupid journalist. You know, he's just, he's interviewing the farming association president or, so they knew I was a journalist. I was not, because this is what they're wondering. Is he CIA, <coughs> is, it's crazy this country, how many agencies. He's not CIA, he's not DEA, he's not ATF, he's not ICE and he's not FBI or he's not something else. So right away, it's like, he's just a journalist. Okay, what's he reporting on? Ah, oh, he's just covering dead bodies and he's not doing investigative reporting. He's innocent. As long as I don't photograph certain things. But you know, uh, murder scenes, like in Juarez, you have to figure out things, right? Like everybody talks about embedding Afghanistan, like, oh, you're under control. Look, 
Anyone who works in this city understands message control by the government. You don't have to get an embed in Iraq or Afghanistan to try and have the government control the way you're taking pictures. It happens at the White House all the time. Thank God that there are very skilled people who always look at the rules and find a way around it. And that's what I do too. I would light a cigarette at the police tape and melt the police tape at the murder scene and walk forward. The cop would turn around saying, what are you doing? I'm like, what? He goes, oh, the, the tape fell down. I said, what? I don't see. I said, well, let me get some pictures while I'm here. So <laughs> it, it, it's about finding the holes in the system. And that is what good journalists always do. And I learned that from my colleagues is there's all, no matter how much of a wall the government puts up, there's always a crack somewhere you can find a hole somewhere. There's always a gaffe or there's a look the president or someone else makes and we get the picture. And that was my job in Mexico. And uh, I would hang out with lots of local journalists. So safety in numbers. We go out somewhere in the field, we go three pickup trucks full of photographers. So I remember once, this is a funny story, we're driving in Sinaloa, we're going to, cover, we can't find this murder we're looking for, the, these bodies. We're driving around three trucks of guys and we got cameras. And I guess from a distance we looked like a, a group of armed men. So we're driving and we got sunglasses on, cigarettes, and we're driving in the back of this pickup truck and this poor Doritos pickup truck guy is looking terrified <laughs> and he turns off the highway and is driving for his life from us through the field to get away from us thinking we were narcos. You are a little scary. Yeah, well, I, we had beards and stuff, but anyway. It was kind of a humorous moment, but. Do you have your, the paper there? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to brag about one photo you took which was not on the, and it's related to the question. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Which one is it of? The, who else has one question while I look for this? Um, how about in the middle of there? Sorry, just to move it around. Which, which one is it? The witness is on the street. Oh, it's not in here, it's not in here. Uh, hi, I'm Connor Matthews with the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. And I was just asking, you saw a lot of image control with the police and the drug trafficking, but did you see a lot of image control with other sectors of Mexican society? Yeah, the media, the Mexican <coughs> government, and and what would be we would just let's just call them the narcos, th those three, and uh, amongst those three, I mean, it, it's not so much about image control, but it's the use of images to control something. So yeah, you can call it image control, but it's more about controlling your message. So if I'm the government, security is fine. We got everything. We're arresting them. We're busting the drugs. Narco's like, hey man, we're in control, not them. And that cartel, they're not in control either. We're in control in this town. And if it's the media, it's like, hey, in some cases, some newspapers are like, hey, more bodies you put in there, more pictures, more newspapers we sell. Some are like, we're putting too many bodies. We're giving into the narcos. No more. Or one newspaper gets a phone call. Hey buddy, you publish any more news pictures of that, you're dead. Or hey, you're going to publish these pictures tonight, and if you don't, you're going to get two more grenades in. And yes, grenades have been thrown. A lot of journalists have been killed there. And some newspapers are like, we no longer cover the drug war because they've killed two more journalists. So it, it, it is about sort of controlling what, it's more about controlling us. That's what it really is all about. So it doesn't just happen in Mexico. It happens right, this is the capital of, of message control, the United States, like right here in New, you know, and it's our job to understand and look at as many sources, Fox, CNN, all of them, and sort of f intelligently form our own opinions. And that's what really I wanted this to all be about, about forming your own opinion and using sort of Mexico as a platform for that. So Louis has such a vast body of work from this year-long reporting um, that one of my favorite pictures did not make it into this project, um, but it made it into some of the other publishing. And it's, it's kind of related to the one of the girl angels, and it relates back to your, your question about the impact on society and, and how desensitized people get. And one of the things I, I like about the concept of this paper and also the name Mira Mexico, which is sort of a, a playful, it, it could mean uh, look at Mexico or Mexico looks, and the sort of act of witnessing. And one picture that I thought was very powerful um, that I think was in the FP package yeah, and elsewhere was just, it was a, a shot of people lining up along a street and it looks like it's in front of a school and kids have come out, but there's street vendors and it's just a wonderful tableau of sort of street life in Mexico, which uh, for those of you who've been there, it's, it's bustling, it's vibrant and, and it's, but there are all these people who are clearly just fixated on looking at one scene and what's powerful, really powerful about that shot is 
we have no idea what they're looking at until you know Louis, as the interlocutor, kind of tells us that it's it's obvious it's a it's a shooting, but you don't see the violence. You just see you know a, a lot of people's reaction to it, and it just re leaves you with this question of what is the impact of that on individuals, on kids, on a society of witnessing all that violence over time, and particularly when these cartels. And the government are concerned that as people become desensitized, they have to ratchet up the spectacle of it. Um, and I think that's, that question has framed some of this work in the way that we can sort of play on, do you want to be witness to the violence or do you want to step back and be witness to the society that is uh, afflicted by it and is witnessing it and be sort of have a more indirect take on it? Um, so congratulations again on this work and thank you for this Thanks. evening. Please stick around and have another beverage and let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks,